right, Tim, why do you think Intel keeps using E cores? Why not use all P cores like AMD? Well, AMD just, yeah, I guess they use P cores. I guess so. Yeah. <laughs> they use just, yeah. Well, not, not all their CPU architectures, mind you, but the ones yes. that are relevant to this conversation, probably on desktop, that is largely yep. true. So I guess to answer this question, you first have, why, why do we have E cores? Like, why, why did E cores come about? And the obvious answer is, well, they were getting destroyed in terms of what the CPU could do. So I think probably the most recent uh, comparison would be like the 3950X versus the 10900K, right? Because the yeah. 10900K, that was 11th gen, I suppose, but they went backwards in core count there and 11th gen just sucked really bad. Yeah. So let's go with the, the 10 core, 20 thread, 10900K. Yep. Uh, the 3950X was like 50% faster while only using 20% more power for core heavy productivity workloads. That was the first generation of 16 cores yes. on AM4, right? Yes, yep. which is what's triggered the need for E cores, yep. which I guess we're working towards. So uh, they got to a, a fork in the road, a point in time where AMD was offering 50% more performance in core heavy productivity workloads. And that's a substantial difference to have. So... How does Intel address that? And obviously, they'd seen this coming, right? Because yep. that was it was already evident because we had the Threadripper CPU. So the 3950X was the first mainstream desktop socket, which was AM4, to go and, and do this. But we'd already seen evidence of it as early as first generation uh, Zen with the 50, the 1950X. That was the Threadripper part, wasn't yep. it? Yep. Yeah, that, that yep. was the 16 core, the first one they did, and then it scaled up to 32 cores eventually. So AMD, uh, sorry, Intel knew this was coming from AMD, that there was they could use multiple CCDs, create these core-heavy CPUs, and they just had no way of competing with them with a monolithic uh, GP, uh, CPU design. Like They just couldn't do it. So they got up to 10 cores, wasn't really able to go further than that, the, whole heap of different problems creep in essentially mm -hmm. so then 12th gen came along and that added the e cores which was still monolithic design but you're able to fit more cores in that monolithic die which you hope improves efficiency and and the yeah. workloads that they can tackle and it did like i mean they get dubbed as cinebench accelerators a fair bit because that's really sort of um tile-based rendering is where they work really well other workloads varying degrees of success but it addressed yep. a real problem where they were miles behind and it got them, in some instances, probably ahead, depend again, depending yep. on the workload. Um, yeah, and I think the thing, you know, when you were mentioning about the, the monolithic design, the P cores, like one P core, uses about the same die space as a four E core cluster. Yeah. And so I guess Intel has gone, well, what is better for multi-thread productivity? Is it one P core or is it four E cores? And I think for those really heavy workloads, like the optimal cases, four E cores is clearly faster for that sort of mm -hmm. workload. But then there are other workloads that are single thread dependent or gaming where the E cores are not very good, mm -hmm. where you want the high IPC, the frequency, the performance that a P core can offer. So yeah, what we've seen with AMD to achieve more cores is split it into two die. So they don't have to worry as much about die space and yields of a monolithic die because they just add eight cores into one die and then give you a second die. Whereas Intel yeah. throughout all this, these generations has largely gone monolithic until this latest generation. Yeah, I made a few notes to add to what you're saying here. So um, the 1000K was a 206 square millimeter die. Yep. Uh, so 206, and the 3950X had a pair of CCDs, which were 74 millimeters. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there was a 124 uh, IO die, and that totaled 272 square millimeters. Yep. So significantly bigger overall uh, die space spread across three dies, which improves with yields, so cheaper manufacturing, you get yep. more of them. Uh, just... Cheaper cost because the IO die was typically a node behind, yep. so that, that benefited them. So very cost effective. Yeah. The, the drawback is stuff like latency increases, but it was really the way forward. And Intel tried to avoid that for so long, and now they've got yep. to the Arrow Lake thing where they've had to pay the latency penalty by splitting it up. Yeah, and you just think about like a 10900K with 10 cores, you said it was around 200 square millimeters. Mm -hmm. If they wanted to get that up to 16 cores, 
you're looking at that die being almost the size of like a GPU, mm -hmm. like 300 square millimeters, monolithic. It's just not as cost effective. And then, as you say, if they're thinking about the future, like where does that scale beyond that? Where are they getting the performance from? If they have to add more cash in, make the cores bigger to fit in more IPC, that all impacts like how much you can physically do in that die without the sizes getting ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So they went with this sort of hybrid design, which I guess is great for some, you know, you can make a server where it's all e-cores. So if you're designing the e-core, it is, it is beneficial for, you know, you can create different designs depending on what you want. But it has created things like we were talking about with the scheduling issue, where now you've got two different core designs. So you've got to deal with how do you make sure that some apps that need p-cores are on the p-cores? And how do you make sure that you know games avoid e-cores if they need to use eight cores and stuff like that? So it's, mm -hmm. it's a more complex design, but they're sort of trying to balance all those factors of single thread performance, multi-thread performance, making sure the latencies aren't so bad. And potentially with, you know, Intel moving to tile-based design now, they can do even more stuff with P-cores and E-cores. And maybe we do see some more exotic designs that sort of mix up things. Maybe they put E-cores on their own chiplet or whatever, or, or tile, and they don't include that on some parts or include mm -hmm. more P-core tiles. Mm -hmm. It's all very interesting to see where that stuff goes. Just unfortunately, you know, Arrow Lake didn't necessarily have the, the performance that we were hoping for in some areas, but at least like multi-thread performance is probably one of its stronger aspects. So from that sense, the e-core thing has kind of been a success. But mm -hmm. overall, there's probably still a few other challenges. Yeah, well, without the e-cores, they'd be nowhere for productivity. That'd be a big problem. Yeah. So it'd be a one-trick pony. Even this generation would be like pretty good for gaming because mm -hmm. they're, they're not dominant in gaming anymore and useless for productivity. So it has certainly made it a more well-rounded design. It's, it's addressed uh, a serious need there. So yep. yeah, hopefully it's something that they can improve upon over time mm -hmm. because the the infinity fabric the splitting up of the the ccds the io die all that stuff quite a few iterations of that now and it's still an ongoing project for amd they refine it constantly whereas intel's just starting down that path now mm. so yeah i think when people talk about like the p core only design it's largely for things like gaming but i guess there's always that question of do you need like 10 or 12 p cores for gaming no it seems like eight and even six is sufficient in a lot of mm -hmm. circumstances, as we've seen from Zen as well. Like, there's not a lot of benefit from the, the high core count models for gaming. So if you're thinking about, like, why is there a multi-core CPU? Like, why do we have so many cores? Beyond a certain amount of P-cores, obviously the benefits start coming to, well, let's just make smaller cores and put more of them on and mm -hmm. then hope for the best in terms of those productivity apps. So the, I think the balance that they've gone with does make sense. Like, mm -hmm. I know there was a bit of disappointment. They were thinking of Intel. Intel was thinking of making, I think, like Bartlett Lake or something, which was meant to be 10 or 12 P cores. I can't remember quite what the rumors were suggesting. I think the rumors were saying that that ship was canceled and there was a bit of disappointment. But as far as I can tell, like eight P cores is probably probably enough. They mm -hmm. just need to address other aspects of the design, not just add more P cores in and hope for the best. Yeah, yeah I guess from a... a purely gaming perspective, the e-cores are just a waste of silicon because they're not super useful. So I can see from from that mm. perspective, it's it's yeah, adding yeah. a thing to the CPU that just isn't useful to you. But as we're saying, they're necessary to make the CPU good at things other than just gaming. Yeah, I think if anything, for a gaming part, you wouldn't want like 10 p-cores or 12 p-cores. You just want the e-cores cut out, making the die smaller and cheaper. That's yeah. that's pretty much all you'd, or, you'd want Or making from that. the actual individual P cores more powerful. Because as right. we've said, yeah, yeah. for game, we've, we've said this for so long, which is why we haven't been bashing six core CPUs. As long as the cores are more powerful, you will get better gaming performance. And it's actually better to have a, a, a smaller amount of, of powerful cores than it is to have you know, a whole heap of them because you yep. run into the scheduling issues. Like even if you have a whole heap of P cores, there, there's still a latency penalty to be paid when going from one core that's here and then one core that's over there. You want yeah, them to be yeah. scheduled that it's using the cores in the same sort of section, but there's, there's a whole heap of challenges there. But anyway, I think the e-cores have been a good band-aid solution. That's probably yeah, the best yeah. way to put it.